Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life Science Across the Globe. I'm Janine Stevens, one of the Janelia organizers of this series. And on behalf of all eight of sister institutes, I welcome you to today's event on Chemistry for Biological Systems, hosted by the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. But before we get started, I want to encourage everyone to visit lifesciencecrosstheglobe.org to see our full lineup of monthly events for this year, to subscribe to the calendar so that you don't miss out, and also to review recordings of all of our past events. We would also love to have your input on a brief survey that we're going to post in the chat box at the end of today's session. And a reminder to all of the trainees on the call to please stay on after the event today for a special meet the panelists session with our speakers and our moderator. Audience, you can go ahead and write your questions in the Q&A box at any time, and our moderator will ask them during the Q&A period. And I will now like to turn it over to Professor G2 Mayor, Director of NCBS, for some opening remarks. Thank you, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, you know, good evening, good morning, and everything in between uh, to our to our viewers. It's um, uh, I, I'm Satyajit Mayor, uh, Director of the NC, the National Center for Biological Science, uh, Center of the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. Um, just a brief uh, um, introduction to the NCBS. Uh, at, at the NCBS, we study biology across all scales, from biomolecules to ecosystems. Um, and as you must all know, that chemistry is the language of communication at all these scales. Uh, and, um, and of course, um, we are delighted to host this session on new chemistry for biological systems. Uh, and with, with that, I'd now like to invite my colleague, uh, Mukun Thattai, who actually tries to understand how biological systems communicate from an evolutionary perspective. And I'd like to invite him now to moderate this session and introduce our speakers for this evening. Thank you, Jitu. If you want to look at an extreme example of, of physics, you'll probably have to look long, long ago to the Big Bang or far, far away to a supermassive black hole at the center of a distant galaxy. But if you want to look at the most extreme, bio, extreme chemistry in the universe, all you have to do is look under your nose because that's what living systems do. They do extreme chemistry. Um, the talks today, an extremely exciting lineup, um, really will showcase how chemistry provides not just tools, but also a point of view uh, to understand biology. The first speaker is Bonnie Bassler, a professor and HHMI investigator at Princeton University. And she's going to give a talk which uh, is in the theme of biology inspired by chemistry. She's going to tell us about the language of cellular communication. Bonnie. Uh, thanks. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to kick this off. And so let me share my screen with you to get going. So you already got a good introduction um, of what I'm going to tell you about it. But in my words, what I want to try to ask, or what my gang is always trying to ask, is how bacteria get any bang for their buck. You know, bacteria are really tiny, and yet they do all these terrible and all these miraculous things. And my group always tries to understand how they can manage to be so powerful. So, so we're, I'm going to try to tell you that it's about chemical communication and that it spans domains. Okay, so what we think is that for bacteria to do the beneficial and the harmful tasks that they do, they have to understand times when they're alone and times when they're in groups, so they can behave differently under those two scenarios. And so the way that they monitor whether they're alone or in groups is through a chemical communication process that we call quorum sensing. And that's shown on my first slide in a cartoon. So when bacteria are alone, they want to have the program of gene expression going that's good for acting as an individual. So they're carrying out some subset of the tasks that they're capable of doing. But among the things they do is that they make and release small molecules that I have drawn as these red triangles that we call autoinducers. So the world is big. Bacteria are small. These autoinducers diffuse away. The bacteria can't detect them. And that says act like an individual. But as bacteria grow and divide, since all of the cells are making a share of this autoinducer molecule, the extracellular concentration of the molecule increases in proportion to cell number. And so when the molecule hits a particular threshold amount, the bacteria detect it and they infer from that detection event that they must have neighbors around. So in unison, 
all of the bacteria change their gene expression, they change their behaviors together, and they begin to carry out tasks that are only successful when all the cells act together. So group or collective behaviors. So in fact, the bacteria don't have a clue whether they're alone or together or how many cells they're around. They're using the chemical as a proxy for cell number. And they believe, if you will, that the chemical tells them something about how many neighbors are around. So that's quorum sensing. And so we've discovered a number of the molecules that the bacteria use to talk to each other. And we think that it takes at least three molecules to have a proper quorum sensing conversation. So I'm going to show you three. These come from Vibrios, which is where quorum sensing was initially discovered. So I'm showing you particular molecules, but um, the principles, so bacteria tinker with the molecules, they change the molecules, but the principles I'm telling you transcend all quorum sensing systems that we know of. So there's always a molecule that one and only one species makes. So in this case, this homocerian lactone, and that molecule is for intra-species communication. This is how I count my siblings. Then there's a molecule we discovered, this fatty acid, that all vibrios make, but nobody but vibrios make, as far as we can tell. So this molecule is for the genus. So this molecule says you're my cousin, this molecule says you're my twin. Then the third molecule we discovered is broadly made in the bacterial world, gram negatives, gram positives, and they all make the identical molecule. So we think this third molecule on the bottom has no species information in it. It simply says other. So now what we're starting to think about quorum sensing is quorum sensing is about counting your neighbors, but it's also about telling how closely or how distantly related my neighbors are to me. So the molecules encode something about number and something about species relatedness, right? So that bacteria then can tell self from other with these molecules and they be behave appropriately based on the blend. So in back, going back to my original cartoon, we think the computation the bacteria do is as follows. The first thing they do is they're asking, am I alone or am I in a group? And so they start to, to detect quorum sensing molecules and that sets the program of genes that they turn on and off based on being alone or in a group. But then the more sophisticated computation they do is they measure the ratios of those molecules that I just showed you. And that says, is it me and my kin in the majority or is the enemy in the majority? And then they change their behavior based on whether they're winning or losing and who is in the consortium. Okay, so they can sell self, self from other and they use that information to behave appropriately under the different scenarios that they find themselves in. All right, so that's my background on quorum sensing. And now I want to tell you, of course, about some new science. So I'm going to stick with Vibrios and I'm going to tell you about new findings that we have in the global pathogen Vibrio cholera. So perhaps you know that Vibrio cholera is an endemic bacterium that causes a um, diarrheal disease. People get cholera from drinking contaminated water, eating contaminated food. And so cholera must have quorum sensing to be a pathogen. We showed that. And the way that this insidious bacterium works is that when it gets into the host at low cell density, it kind of comes in guns loaded. It's highly infectious. It's making a biofilm. It's spewing out its toxins. And then in the intestine, as it grows and multiplies, quorum sensing autoinducers kick in and that tells cholera to shut down its virulence and biofilm genes, turn on its escape genes and it escapes in high numbers out to infect the next victim. So it has to have quorum sensing, but it's all about dissemination. And so we showed that quorum sensing systems using the molecules that I just told you about control that switch. But then about a year ago, we discovered a new quorum sensing system in cholera. So what uh, uh, we discovered was there was a receptor uh, which is in the cytoplasm that we named VQMA for Vibrio Quorum A. There was a cytoplasmic receptor. This is a transcription factor that at low cell density, when the autoinducers aren't there, turns on virulence, turns on biofilms. So just like I told you, cholera is infecting and it's really um, pathogenic. Then at high cell density, a new autoinducer accumulates that we named DPO. This molecule binds to the VQMA receptor. It turns on a small RNA. So these are like micro RNAs in eukaryotes that shuts off all the virulence genes and turns on the escape genes. We discovered what that molecule is. This was a graduate student, a first year graduate student named Justin Silpi for his rotation project. He discovered this molecule that we call DPO. And this is a picture of it. It's made from threonine 
and alanine. So a very simple molecule. And what I should tell you is that this molecule and the three that I showed you on the last slide, every one of these is a brand new molecule to mankind. So these bacteria are ingenious about making molecules that await discovery and have all these functions. In this case, controlling quorum sensing. Okay, so this switch controls virulence in cholera and it tells cholera to leave the host at high cell density. So when Justin had made those findings, he was trying to understand more about this new system. And he found this interesting asymmetry. He found that the VQMA receptor, this transcription factor, is present in every Vibrio, but no bacterium except Vibrios have that receptor. This molecule, DPO, by contrast, was broadly made in the bacterial world. So all kinds of bacteria make DPO. So he was trying to understand the difference between production of the signal molecule and reception of the signal molecule. And that is still a mystery in our lab, but because, and we haven't solved that. But what was interesting is that what Justin found was that he did find another VQMA, but it wasn't in a bacterium. He found a gene for VQMA, for a quorum sensing receptor on a phage. And so phages are viruses that infect bacteria. And so this phage called VP882 infects Vibrios. So it's a little plasmid, it's a phage, it gets into Vibrios. And then what happens is that this phage has to decide, stay or go, stay or go. And so that's called lysogeny, when it stays, lysis, when it goes you know, when it replicates and kills the host and goes to a new um, host bacterium. And so the lysis decision was, we could see genes on this uncharacterized phage that control the lysis decision, like in classic phage biology. There's a repressor called C1 that represses an anti-repressor called Q that turns on the lysis genes. So when the host gets in trouble, when there's stress, when there's DNA damage, C1 gets cleaved, Q gets made and the cells lice. And that has been discovered in many, many phages for over a hundred years. So we could understand that part of the phage. Our question was over here. Why is there a, presumably a bacterial quorum sensing receptor on a phage? There had never been a connection between phages and bacterial quorum sensing before this. So we wondered why is this quorum sensing receptor there, the gene for it? Why is our quorum sensing receptor there? And so we wanted to study that. And of course, I've just told you that we had just discovered DPO and this transcription factor VQMA. So we knew an experiment to do. We could add this autoinducer and see what happens. So what we did was we put the phage, we infected Vibrio cholera with that phage. And now you're just looking at a growth curve. And what you can see is that cholera grows just fine. It grows fine. But then if Justin adds DPO, he adds the autoinducer molecule, what happens is that the phage receptor detects it, and then it turns on lysis and kills all of the cholera at high cell density. So that shows you that this phage is eavesdropping on bacterial quorum sensing. It's monitoring the bacteria growing, and at high cell density, which, the, which occurs when these autoinducers accumulate, the phage kills the bacteria, the present host, and spreads to another. And so if you think about it, right, it's a really great strategy for this phage. It's like phages, right, if they don't, if they decide to kill their present host, but they don't get to another victim, they're goners. So when's a good time to kill your host? Well, at high cell density, because there's lots of other cells around to be infected. So this phage is surveilling or eavesdropping on quorum sensing in the host. So then Justin wanted to understand how does that work? How is this phage, this new quorum sensing system connected to this lysis program that's classic that I told you about? So he did a genetic screen to find what component connects phage quorum sensing and the lysis machinery. And what he found was that the gene or the component that connects it was sitting right next to the VQMA gene in the phage. There was a tiny little gene, this red one, running in the opposite direction that encodes a 78 amino acid protein that has no homology to anything in the database, nothing. So Justin got to name this protein. And so he calls it Q-tip for quorum triggered inactivator of C1 protein. So Q-tip connects phage quorum sensing to lysis. And so what Justin next wanted to know is how does Q-tip do its job? And I'm just going to show you the answer. What Q-tip does is it sequesters this repressor and inactivates it. 
So what you're looking at, this is just a picture of E. coli under a microscope, and it has the C1 protein cloned into it. And that has a halo tag, so the E. coli turned green. And so what you can see is that the C1 is diffuse in the cytoplasm. If Justin co-expresses his new protein Q-tip with C1, what you can see is that Q-tip drags all of the C1 out of the cytoplasm to the poles in these inclusion bodies and it inactivates it. And now I hope you can see why we call this protein Q-tip. These E. coli look like real Q-tips to us. And so all of the C1 goes to the poles and it's inactive. So this C1 is active this C1 is inactive. So that explains the mechanism. When the phage launches quorum sensing, Q-tip gets made, Q-tip drags C1 out and the cells die because the phage lyses them. Okay, so now what I should tell you is that that is the first time that there has been evidence that phages um, interpret signals other than cell stress or DNA damage. And so this idea that they're monitoring host biology was new. And so we worried at that point that this was just some one-off. There was this weird phage, you know, out there, it had these genes, you know, maybe it was just an, an anomaly. So once Justin had this little module of these two genes, then he could do a better database analysis. And sure enough, what he found is that this is not a one-off. He could find all kinds of plasmid-like phages. So these are phages that live as plasmid in their cells, all of which have this classic lysis machinery, and every one of which has a transcription factor, and right next to it, in the opposite direction, a tiny little protein. So these transcription factors and these little red proteins are not like one another. They don't share homology, but they all function the same. So what I mean by that is we can clone any one of these out and they will sequester any one of these C1 repressors. So they work by the same mechanism. So we think this might be common that phages are eavesdropping on bacterial host biology. And so to put it together, what I'm telling you is that in our case, this phage is monitoring this quorum sensing autoinducer, DPO, that molecule, at high cell density, this these bind, the transcription factors turns on Q-tip, Q-tip um, drags C1 out of solution, Q is unleashed, and lysis happens. In these other cases, we don't know, you know, these are just database analysis. We don't know what these phages are monitoring. We don't know what host biology is involved. But what we're guessing then is that it's going to be common that phages eavesdrop or surveil appropriate host biology. And then using this new mechanism that Justin discovered, they lyse their host and go off to infect another victim when the time is ripe. And so we're really curious to try to solve what this biology is, but we don't know it. Okay, so now I've shown you that there's this new mechanism connecting quorum sensing to um, phage lysis. And so Justin thought, you know, what these phages are doing then is they appear to be re-engineering their lysis cascades to be tuned to some host information. So we thought, well, heck, if the phages can do that, I can do that. And so we thought what we could do is take our basic understanding that we had gotten from Justin's study, and then he could make a phage therapy by using what he had learned. So I'm going to show you one example. He made like a dozen of these, and I'll just show you one, and you can use your imagination to understand um, the rest of this. All right, so we have this phage, right? And I've told you the phage is a plasmid. So we can transform this phage into any bacterium that we care to, not just vibrios. We can just pop it into anybody. And what you understand is that it's all about this Q. If Q gets made, the cell is going to lyse. So what and Justin did was he cloned different promoters in front of this Q gene, and these are promoters that he could control. So I'm going to show you this one example. He put a promoter, just 100 bases of DNA, for a promoter called IMVF. This is a salmonella promoter. So in salmonella, which is a, a pathogen. When salmonella is under virulence conditions, this transcription factor called Hill A detects virulence conditions and it binds the INVF promoter and turns on invasion genes and salmonella invades the host. Okay, but now what Justin's done is he's put the INVF promoter in front of Q. Then he put this recombinant phage into salmonella. We put salmonella under virulence conditions and Hill A did its job. It went and turned on 
this INVEP promoter. The problem was it's on front of Q. And so all of the Seminella committed suicide, right? So you get it, he can control that Q gene and then the, the phage will do its job and kill the host, right? So now you get it, it's not about Vibrios. You can put this in any bacterium. And I told you that Justin made 10 or a dozen of these, you know, and so you can, you can take, if you know the, a promoter and can control it, like with the Rabidose, tetracycline, IPDG, or anything you want, if you can control the promoter, you can get the phage to kill on demand. And so we hope then that this little, it's a toy application could help our colleagues who make applications and perhaps they could, people who are better at it than us could maybe make this into some kind of phage therapy that is controllable. All right, so that's the applied part of the work. And let me finish by just going back to the basic part of the work. And I'm gonna to put together what I've told you in the context of you know, other of our findings. So cholera has to get into the host. When it gets into the human host intestine, it decides stay or go, stay or go. That decision is mediated by quorum sensing, by a number of quorum sensing systems, including this new one that I told you about that involves this DPO molecule. So it makes and and DPO, DPO accumulates when, when VQMA bind, the cholera VQMA binds DPO, cholera disperses from the host and goes to infect the next patient. You remember that I told you that lots of bacteria make DPO. What Justin showed is that microbiome bacteria make DPO. You might even remember I told you that DPO was made from threonine and alanine. So it turns out that your microbiome, which is there keeping you healthy, it lives, part of what it lives on is a protein called mucin. So mucin is a protein that covers our intestinal cells. It keeps them hydrated. It keeps the microbiome bacterium a little bit far away. And microbiome bacteria use mucin as an energy source. They have mucinases. They're supposed to, right? You, the host, supply them with this mucin. So it turns out that every third amino acid in mucin is threonine. And so it turns out that you feed your bacteria mucin, they take the threonine, and what they do is that they make DPO. So now DPO accumulates even more than what cholera makes. And it turns out that if a mouse, not a human yet, but a mouse has particular DPO making microbiome bacteria, DPO accumulates too fast and cholera disperses prematurely. So what we think then is that you, the human, and your microbiome are teamed up to use DPO to trick cholera into miscounting and dispersing early. And so for sure, these mice, mice, not humans yet, get less severe cholera disease. It's known that some people get bad cholera disease and some people get mild cholera disease. And we wonder if this DPO and the microbiome might be a part of it, but that's not been shown. And then last now for today, we have to add another player here, which is the virus, right? So the parasite of the parasite is also monitoring this DPO and it's deciding stay or go, stay or go, stay in my present cholera or, or kill my current host and escape to the next. And so what's so interesting to us is we no longer know how anybody counts appropriately. All these organisms are using this molecule and making it and consuming it, right? And so we're trying to understand how bacteria and viruses count robustly in these complicated scenarios. That's our next task, right? Is to try to do experiments now that are much more complex where we have lots of players involved and we're not just shaking them around in a flask. And we try to set up these authentic conditions to understand how this works in real life. But at least what we know is that all of these organisms seem to optimize off this DPO molecule that's just made from threonine and alanine, right? These two little amino acids, right? But a brand new molecule, a brand new um, quorum sensing circuit. And we think then that this is at least a three-way conversation that has eukaryotic cells, beneficial bacteria, harmful bacteria, and viruses all working somehow to use this molecule to count. Anyway, and so obviously there's lots of mysteries for us to solve, and these are the kinds of questions that we're working on on this project. And I will finish by telling you, showing you Justin Silpi. So Justin Silpi was a rotation student. He solved the structure of the molecule when he was a rotation student, decided to join the lab, and he did all of the work on the phage that I told you about. And uh, that's my talk, and I really look forward to the rest of the symposium one more time. I'm delighted to be here and to answer your questions after we hear a few more talks. So thanks. Thank you, Bonnie. That was uh, that was amazing. I, what I really loved is you're, you're just chasing the questions across kingdoms, but in each case, you're drilling down to the chemical details. And and you know, I, I, I'm not sure how many people would be able to pull that off. Um, 
The second uh, talk today um, is by uh, Zorana Zaratchik. She's an associate professor at ESPCI Paris, and it's going to be in the theme of biology inspiring artificial chemistry, which may even hold clues to how life would work on uh, other planets. Uh, Zorana? Does it work? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. perfect. Yeah, so now for something completely different. So we are going to talk about uh, artificial chemistries. Um, so what you see here in this image is a zoom into the Orion Nebula, which was made by the Herschel Space Telescope. So it is in the infrared. And so by analyzing the, the spectrum, what they found, and astrophysicists and astronomers, they found ionized carbon atoms in its center. And in one of his uh, TV episodes about Cosmos, Carl Sagan said that uh, we are all made of star stuff. And what he actually means uh, by this, this is just an observation, that sums the fact that carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and some other heavy atoms were all created in previous generations of stars, some four and a half billion years ago. Now, life as we know it is um, uh, exists in a multitude of forms, but when broken down to the most basic elements, it is the same star stuff that we just mentioned. So we have carbon bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and elements like sulfur and, and phosphorus. Now, nucleic, nucleic acids like RNA and DNA contain all these basic uh, elements, basic building blocks. If we zoom in a little bit more, some amino acids and proteins are built uh, with, by elements up to sulfur, others by uh, elements up to nitrogen. Carbohydrates and um, uh, lipids are mostly made out of hydrogen, oxygen, and, and uh, carbon. And then the hydrocarbons are made out of the first two elements. Now, all these building blocks give us these beautiful life forms like this tree or this little echidna or the, the leafy sea dragon or the dragonflies. So life forms that are very, very broad and diverse, but made just of these very few building blocks. And so in the, in the words of Darwin, it is interesting to contemplate a, a tangled bank <laughs> occluded uh, with many plants and many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about and with worms crawling through the damp earth. And to reflect that all these elaborately constructed forms have been produced by laws acting around us. So really a central question for scientists from, from different fields, from biology, physics, chemistry, engineering, that are interested in the life around us, so someone like me, you're interested in what are the rules, uh, rules and laws behind what we see in nature. So we want to understand really the physics of life. But now the life as we know it is, is just basically a, a one possibility, one instance that we know. And really to have a theory of, of what is actually it is necessary to understand what are all the possibilities. And these are the thoughts that uh, spurred the field of artificial life, which is basically a synthetic approach to biology, exploring not only life as we know it, but also life as it could be. Now, what has guided my research into the, uh, what we call an un unknown over the past years is inspired by nature, but not limited by what we see in nature. And so by limited, what I mean is that uh, uh, I'm not considering only the building blocks of life as we know it and reaction that we know. So we lift those constraints and we ask the questions, what are the necessary ingredients we need to achieve a desired lifelike function or property, but without the limitations. So what we assume is that we have available any type of a building block with any type of interaction and reaction possible, but they all have to follow laws of physics. So in other words, we are interested in necessary ingredients to achieve desired functions, but in physically realizable systems. We are also interested in how we can control different levels of organization of artificial matter in order to mimic life. Now, we do all this with the goal of finding efficient and robust design rules at different scales. Uh, why we want to have things being efficient, this is sort of intuitive, but robustness really, this is, this is the property of life. And um, everything that I've said basically relies on the fact that we need to have these artificial building blocks, many different types. And because of that, for, for many decades, research in artificial life has either been limited to just biological systems that we know or computer programs and simulations. But now in the last 10 years or so, it, uh, this changed dramatically. And so now we can do many more things. And this is what I want to show you. So what properties of building blocks uh, we can control and we actually need to control? So 
we need to control how isotropic they are uh, or anisotropic, right? We want to control the valence and how they interact with things. And so one of the main ingredients that uh, allows us to make these artificial building blocks and artificial chemistries is DNA. Now, DNA strands act as a specific group. If you take a single strand of some length, you know immediately what is the complementary strand that will make the double helix together with the first strand. And so for first perfect binding, it has to be complementary strand. Now, if you have a strand of length 10, you have over a million different sequences that you can make, or basically a million different glues that you can make, artificial building blocks. Um, so here I'm just showing a few examples in the experiments that, uh, uh, that uh, people have, have done. So the, the DNA can uh, be used as a specific glue. So basically what, what researchers do, they take these DNA strands and they, they put them on surfaces of nano and micron size particle, like what is shown here in the first uh, uh, three images. So here the, the different color means that uh, particles have different types of interactions, different types of DNA on itself, and then they can bind only if they have also the complementary strands. Now, DNA can be used as a building block, and this is now in, shown in these uh, next, uh, next few, uh, few images, where by combi in a combination of uh, long and short strands, uh, people can assemble basically any type of any building block of any type or, or, or any, any shape that you can imagine by just carefully designing uh, the sequence. Now, this is the, not the only uh, way to make artificial building blocks. You can also play with just purely shape. But this is, uh, I will, I put here a few images, but we will not, uh, they will not be needed for the rest of the talk. Now, another important thing uh, about uh, DNA interaction is that they can be tuned and turned to be on and off by changing the temperature. And so at, at which temperature basically this, this happened really depends on the, on the, how you design the sequence. So now, this, all this, what I've just said, makes my life as a theorist easy because I can just assume that indeed we can have any kind of a building block that we want. We can design any kind of interactions that we, that we want. And so the model system that I work with is just based on, based on spherical particles coated with DNA. So they're usually microns, like we imagine micron sized particle. And then the DNA is in, on the nanoscale. So basically we are talking about very short range interactions. Now, another thing that is, quite uh, important for what I will tell you, and that doesn't exist in all, all the systems, is, is something that we call species valence. And so in, 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 with the particles which are either emulsion droplets or, or spherical particles co coated with some um, lipids on the surface, when, we, when, you, when you graph the DNA strands, they can actually be mobile on the surface. And it was shown that, the two, uh, that uh, when two droplets come together, these DNA uh, strands basically are mobilized and they move to make a bond. And by controlling the density, particle uh, valence can be controlled. And so in this particular example, what you can see is a yellow particle that has enough DNA that can bind two red particles. And red particles have enough DNA that can bind uh, uh, only one uh, yellow particle. And so if we make a solution that contains a mixture of these particles, what we will end up having are monomers, dimers, and trimers that are uh, really, that are floppy. Okay, so now that we have all these building blocks, the next, uh, next uh, step is to, uh, to figure out uh, what kind of um, uh, nature processes we would like to study and explore beyond what is observed and to find the laws and rules that govern them. And so within this bio-inspired uh, design, one wants to understand the process of self-assembly or the ability to spontaneously make complex structures from simpler parts with high fidelity. Then one wants to understand the process of self-replication and error correction. The first being the ability to make copies of itself and the second, the correct errors made along the way. And finally, if we could be able to mimic metabolic processes, which basically are to construct self-sustained catalytic cycles and networks of reactions, we would be able really to build like a little micro scale factory of, of parts where we can, we can really control what kind of shapes and um, properties of micro scale assemblies uh, uh, we make. And so over the past years, I've been working on some of these, these problems with an overarching team of, of creating uh, living matter in a jar from the bottom up and basically a search for minimal ingredients that allow us to mimic 
the processes uh, I described in the previous slides. And so in my lab, um, together with my collaborators, we work on several different things. So we, we work on trying to build artificial catalysts from the bottom up, trying to understand what are the necessary ingredients uh, um, that we need to achieve efficiency of enzymes, so nature's catalyst. Then we are trying to understand what makes an artificial chemistry a good chemistry in terms of the number and types of building blocks, types of re uh, reactions uh, that, are, that are there to find, for example, uh, the minimal ones that are needed to, so that the system of uh, coupled reactions can exhibit evolutionary adaptation. Next, we work on self-replicating structures, trying to understand what are the ingredients that we need to replicate any arbitrary structure. And finally, we work on, on polymer folding, and this is where I will say a few more, a few more words. Okay, so folding is connected to the process of self-assembly. So as I mentioned before, self-assembly is a process where pre-existing components, building blocks continuously come together and form complex structures with high fidelity and high yield. So this is something that's very ubiquitous in, in nature. And so how do we explore this process in artificial systems? Well, we take a model system and we try to understand what happens uh, how, how things self-assemble in this model system. So the one that I work with, as I mentioned, are, is, ba is based on spherical particles. And then in experiments, if you just take a bunch of identical spherical particles and you put them in a solution, they will just aggregate together. And principally, if there are many, they will, they will make a, a crystal. But if you limit the number that you put in, if you just take a few, they're going to make ver various kinds of compact structures. And so what I'm showing you here is what kind of uh, structures you can get in two dimensions and three dimensions, well, three dimensions, two dimensions. And so the nice thing about these compact structures is that they can be completely enumerated up to certain size. And now, so going back to the nature self-assembly, the building blocks that come together have very specific interactions, okay? Because for example, in this uh, image here, these are ribosomal RNA and then these red uh, parts that are marked are places where specific proteins come and attach to make the, the ribosome. So if you want to make something very specific, we need to put in specific interactions in our system. And we can do that by coating the particles with DNA as we discussed before. So to make these molecules, so we can, we can we do the following. So for example, um, let's look at the system here where we have uh, eight, par uh, eight particles. And so there are 13 different uh, compact structures that can be spontaneously assembled if all, if all particles are identical. And now we want to make one specific one. We have to introduce specific interactions uh, between, uh, between, building, between particles. And so what I'm showing you here is one particular example of what we call chemistry. Uh, which tells you basically that if we take eight types of building blocks that follow um, these interaction rules, where gray means that uh, particles have complementary DNA strands, strands, they like each other, and white means they, they don't. If we take eight particles following these rules and we put them in a solution, they will spontaneously assemble only this one structure that we have here. Okay, and so now there, there's been really a lot of theoretical and experimental work on questions like this, and, and I'm just listing here some of the names where people are trying to solve this so-called inverse problem. But the, the bottom line is that if we want to reliably um, um, uh, assemble uh, a unique product with high yield, we either need large sets of different building blocks or very complex building blocks in terms of shape and valence. And if you look to nature, <laughs> this is not what nature does, right? So nature uses just 20 types of building blocks, I mean, basically amino acids arranged, so chained in, in polymers and in a specific way, so firing specific sequence. And then these polymers fold into final 3D structures with high yield and fidelity. And so how would you self how would basically the self-assembly through folding look in artificial systems? And so we teamed up with the, the group of Jasna Bruits to, to work on this. Uh, so we are focusing here on two-dimensional system at the, at the moment. And as I said, we can enumerate all possible structures up to a certain size. So I'm just showing you here a, a zoom into how many structures you have at, uh, at size seven. Now, what we can also make is what we call potential energy folding landscapes or folding trees. And that is, if we start from a chain of N particles, we can find what are all the structures that can be formed by sequentially adding bonds until uh, specific compact structures are formed. Now, this is an example uh, where we start from a seven uh, a polymer of length seven. And at each level, 
there are structures that have the same number of bonds and the sequence of bond formations makes what we call a folding pathway. Okay, so now this is when everyone is identical. So now our next step is to try to add specific interactions and to see how we can actually build something high fidelity, but with not a lot of building blocks. Okay, And so we can control the number of different interactions, but we can also control when we turn on and off these interactions. And this is what I mentioned before, by, by designing the DNA sequences, uh, and uh, we can select the temperature at which they are, they are available. And so what I'm showing you here is that if we just take two types of building blocks and we impose certain protocol of how we turn on the interactions, the three available interactions for two uh, different species, we can actually make the system fold into uh, one specific structure and, and not the other ones. And so this is just a, a, a summary of, of what, what we've done so far. And so up to size of 13, there are over 600 different structures one can make. And then with only three colors and, and by varying sequence and protocols, we can reliably assemble over 300 of these structures, which is sort of really amazing because if you actually start from a, 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 like freely uh, uh, floating particles in a solution and 13 of them, <laughs> the only way to make something that's of size, a very specific thing of size 13 is to take 13 different building blocks. And here we can actually do it with three and, and quite reliable. And so these were all theoretical predictions. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, we did this also in experiments and confirmed in simulations that they're calibrated to experiments. So I'm showing you just here uh, nine structures that can be formed if you start from sequences which have alternating uh, uh, flavors. And uh, and here are just at the bottom are folding movies of, uh, uh, of both in simulations and experiments of a specific uh, structure. Now. The questions that we are interested in are which geometries are more designable than others. We want to understand the folding pathways, how I can direct the system to make a specific structure, what is the kinetics of the process, and so on. So there are really lots of questions that we are, we are exploring. And in the end, just a, just a teaser, we basically what is interesting that once we know which compact structures we can get through, through folding, we can start also exploring how one can uh, uh, make higher order structures like protein complexes. And it's sort of, it's interesting to see that if you just focus on, on having uh, one type of this higher order building block, that uh, these, the, the structures that we make, that we see forming are either something like uh, these tubules and fibers, which you know, we see in biology a lot, or these uh, dimers made out of uh, space invaders. And if you know, if you don't know what space invaders are, you are, you are quite young. Okay. So I, I, I finish and I repeat this slide because uh, it really summarizes what I hope I managed to convey in, in this short time, how we are exploring the, the unknown and we search of these uh, minimal uh, ingredients and trying to find these uh, laws and, and rules. And uh, of course, these are my collaborators. The work that I've uh, told you about has been done together with uh, the group of Jasna Bruic and her, her postdoc, Angus McMullen, and with my PhD student, uh, Maitana Munoz Basagut. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions later on when we have the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Zorana. Uh, amazing talk. Um, I think if I were a young person today, even if I don't know what space invaders are, I would sort of uh, want to know how to, how to do this kind of uh, work. Uh, it's really a golden age of uh, um, things like self-assembly and uh, self-organization. Um, the final talk uh, today, uh, will be given by Gurmeet Singh. He's a professor and center head at the Transdisciplinary University uh, right here in, in Bangalore in India. Um, and uh, this will be um, on the theme of uh, natural products and uh, how their chemistry intersects with the chemistry of the human body. Gurmeet. Thanks, Mukund. Hello, everyone. Uh, we've heard about uh, the future of chemistry. And I think what I'll do is now go to the past and see uh, what are the insights that we can get from uh, the past and how they can be relevant uh, to tackle today's challenges. So uh, I'm going to talk on cross-cultural perspectives, focusing on food chemistry. There's a growing uh, realization that chemistry and biology need to work more closely together. Right? Uh, there have been, if you look at last two decades, there have been a flurry of papers and books with titles such as the need for chemistry and biology uh, interface. 
uh, a few journals have been launched over the last two decades as well around. But uh, in fact, in nature, chemistry and biology are not distinct, right? They are studied as one. And in fact, holistic approaches of studying nature are rooted in the two sciences being studied as one. Uh, one such knowledge system is uh, Ayurveda. Right? It studies the chemistry of ingredients and their processing in the context of human biology in a field called Dravyaguna. And through its systematic epistemology, it has Ayurveda has characterized more than 1500 plant species besides uh, minerals and animal origin products as well for their effect on human body. Right? And it uses a multi-scale framework to do so that includes defining ingredients in terms of their uh, five phases, uh, space, gaseous, fire, liquid, solid, and then characterizing them by, by their in-mouth experience called uh, rasa in, uh, in Sanskrit, sweet, salt, sour, bitter, astringent, and pungent. And these in-mouth experiences lead to 11 pairs of biophysical properties, how these materials would behave within the human body, whether they'll be light or heavy, they'll be heating or cooling, they'll be dry or unctuous, smooth or rough, thinning or thickening. And, and this leads to their potency and their post-digestive metabolic effect, which eventually builds up to uh, the effect on what is called as effect on doshas or the bioregulation. Uh, and finally, to their specific therapeutic activities. Uh, there are about these 1500 ingredients so have been used to formulate about uh, more than 4 lakh biologically functional formulations uh, that have been curated in the traditional knowledge digital library uh, available online uh, by the Indian government, uh, CSR, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Right. So let's take the example right, to build this forward of a, uh, a specific group of plant ingredients whose biology of taste is characterized by uh, uh, astringency, right? the kashaya group as it is called uh, in Ayurveda. A number of the superstars of uh, Ayurveda actually uh, belong uh, uh, to this group of plants, no uh, plants like uh, Amblica officinalis, which is the Indian gooseberry, uh, Terminalia uh, chebula, uh, Vitis veniferia, which is uh, known to everybody as as grapes, right? Uh, and uh, Punica grantam, uh, which is pomegranate, yeah? and many more. Right? And uh, uh, some of these are actually becoming stars of the uh, supplement world as well. Resveratrol from uh, from grapes and uh, ellagic acid from uh, from pomegranate. Right, but these estrogen group plants are all rich in uh, a certain group in one group of phytochemicals called as phenolics. Right, and uh, uh, the interesting thing about phenolics is that this is the most widespread and abundant group in our uh, in our diet, and therefore it has generated huge interest from a human health perspective over the last two decades or so. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, uh, this group is also one of the most confounding group of phytochemicals for scientists. If you, for chemists, it has been difficult a difficult journey to actually uh, separate them, purify them, uh, separate them to be able to understand uh, their structure. There's so many of them. Uh, in every plant, so many different uh, molecules uh, in every plant, and uh, and they are uh, they oxidize very equally, uh, very easily. They react with uh, with proteins. They react with the uh, uh, carbohydrates. They react with uh, the metal ions present in food, and it becomes very difficult to characterize them. Right? Uh, for the biologists, they are equally difficult uh, because they don't seem to be very bioavailable. No? And there are papers after papers uh, trying to understand how they could be effective if they are not very bioavailable. Right? So, uh, the, uh, yet if you look at uh, the number of Ayurveda formulations using this group of plants, that suggests that there is a strong biological role there is. Right, and this is on this chart. I'm just uh, taking a partial mapping of uh, Embolica officinalis, the Indian gooseberry, and its benefit in the uh, benefits of its various formulations. So, in about 34 different uh, health benefits, uh, 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 put the Sanskrit names on there because the relationship between the Sanskrit uh, uh, names, the Ayurvedic uh, disease uh, descriptions, and Indian sometimes is not one to one. But maybe if I just uh, risk it, some of the top ones are fever. Uh, skin disease, diabetes, cough, rejuvenation, eye disease, uh, and anemia. Uh, so let's just take a few examples uh, from this list. No, and on my first slide, I, I talk about uh, the role of 
uh, Ayurvedic formulations, uh, uh, especially uh, amla based, embolic oxygen based uh, formulations, and iron uptake. Now, iron uh, deficiency anemia, uh, probably about 20 to 30 percent of the world suffers from it. And uh, in India, if I look at the numbers at the time of pregnancy, nearly half the pregnant women, 50 percent, are anemic at some point, which really affects uh, the health of the infant as well. And uh, uh, so we've been studying the uptake of iron uh, in a model system, uh, globally accepted as a as a good replica of what would happen in a uh, in a clinical study, and that's the CACO2 cell monolayer. And uh, you take a digest of a food a, uh, and and you feed it to this uh, monolayer and see how much of iron is taken up uh, uh, by the cells, and and then move move beyond and uh, into ferritin, etc. Uh, and and what we see is is that uh, uh, there is an increase in uh, iron uh, uptake when, for example, we've been studying uh, green leafy vegetables and how iron would get absorbed from them. And we do see that there is a significant increase when we uh, feed these to the cells uh, with and without in the presence of uh, Amblica officinalis. Right? Uh, uh, literature does show uh, similar things, and in many uh, such publications, it's been pointed out that this could be coming from the presence of ascorbic acid yeah, in the Indian gooseberry. But we've done experiments where we've also uh, looked at ascorbic acid equivalent levels, and we've seen that the bump up that we get because of uh, the Indian gooseberry is way more than we would get from an equivalent amount of uh, Indian gooseberry. And especially if you, uh, the data here, which shows uh, that when you process the food, yeah, the, the actually the vitamin C levels, the ascorbic acid uh, levels go down. And so uh, the, uh, what we may be having here is uh, a, a temperature resistance, something which is possible for uh, processed foods, a way to improve their uh, or iron take from them. Uh, another area uh, where this has been uh, the uh, embolic oxygenase has been used is in the area of uh, glycemic control diabetes, right? Uh, and again, a number of papers have studied, we too are studying the effect on uh, digestive enzyme inhibition, right? Uh, uh, the alpha amylases, the alpha glucosidases. There's also publications that some of the other metabolic enzymes involved in, uh, in the metabolic pathways such as DPP4, etc., can get inhibited by this. So there is probably not just the while this chart is showing just one aspect. It may be playing uh, molecules uh, in uh, the Indian gooseberry, may be playing a more systemic role, right, besides just this. The, a third interesting example uh, is uh, the use of the Indian gooseberry extracts to stabilize uh, oils. Yeah, uh, The uh, Ayurveda formulary uses a lot, lot, number of formulations actually are uh, botanical extracts uh, extracted in butter oil or ghee as it is called. Yeah, And uh, the one challenge when we try and do it just directly is that this makes the uh, ghee extremely unstable. Ghee, any other oil, if you want to infuse, it becomes extremely unstable, prone to rancidity. So how uh, does this all work? So if you read uh, uh, the literature, it shows that there is a pre-processing step which involves uh, treating the ghee with the juice of uh, the Indian gooseberry, which seems to stabilize oil. And when we do this study and uh, look at the stability in a accelerated oxidation uh, instrument, right, where we uh, we take the butter oil. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you you put it into a cell at 130 degrees centigrade, you blow 20 liters per, uh, per minute of uh, air in it and, and oxidize it very rapidly. Under these conditions, what we see that a control butter oil sample would start degrading at about uh, five hours or so, which is what uh, this line here shows. Uh, and if you add the uh, general stabilizers, the BHAs, the THQs, uh, it uh, it probably adds from five hours. It grows to uh, goes to about five and a half, six hours or so. Uh, but if we follow uh, the method given in the classical text, uh, the stability goes all the way up to at least twenty five hours or more, one thirty degrees. In in real terms, that would mean that a butter oil that is typically stable for about six months or so would go on and become stable for about two years or so. So that's quite significant. And all this study from the impact of how do you make formulations more effective and get rid of the acidity. 
uh, the rancidity. So those are quite interesting results that we're looking at. Now, many of these actions probably can be explained. Some of these at least actions can be explained based on the uh, the chelation, uh, metalline chelation properties of uh, polyphenols, the antioxidant properties you know, arising from the structure of the polyphenols. And I, I here I show some uh, four or five uh, very popular uh, polyphenols. And each of them you can see have multiple hydroxyl groups yeah, which uh, can deprotonate easily because of the stable resonance structures which are created. And therefore, that contributes to the antioxidant properties. Or the, the bidentate groups, the ortho diphenyl groups, for example, which, which lead to their iron chelation properties. Right? So understanding these structures do help explain some of these benefits. However, uh, the scientific studies, the examples that I gave, and uh, the structural uh, explanations, though promising, have not fully unearthed, I mean, they have not unearthed the full potential of, uh, of these ingredients uh, that comes through a uh, reading of the Ayurveda. So uh, there are probably, there's fuller study requires uh, new thinking, new scientific tools, is synergy, a synergistic transdisciplinary research approach to deconstruct these Ayurveda formulations and come up with insights that can lead to uh, more contemporary solutions. Now, of course, uh, uh, these new methodologies are coming up. Surely last decade, uh, uh, decade and a half has been revolutionary uh, in that perspective. I, I uh, talk about two of them very briefly, not that they are the most important, but just because I'm a little more familiar with those pieces of, of, of work. You know, the first is about uh, the polyphenols of uh, black tea, uh, a drink which is consumed by uh, more than half the world three times every day. And uh, they have a, a group of molecules called theorubigens, which were uh, described first in the 1940s, 50s by, uh, by a chemist called Roberts, right? And the first one to actually start talking about polyphenols uh, and then by Eddie Haslam in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but uh, no real separation of these has been possible. And whatever HPLC we do, we got uh, what we call as the TR hump, the theorubigen hump, with very only a few spikes, right? And what is hidden underneath this hump has not been known. And this uh, paper by Kuhnert, which appeared around 2013-14, uh, was quite revolutionary in that sense, using uh, mass spectrometry and along with some analytical tools that he, uh, the uh, computational tools that he uh, that he proposed. Uh, he explained the whole reactive chemistry, how six uh, polyphenol molecules, the catechins, go to nearly about 30,000 or so species in black tea. And, uh, and, and those kind of approaches can really unlock uh, from a chemistry point of view, the whole uh, polyphenols. Another more recent uh, story which has been emerging is, a very exciting story, is the, uh, the mediation that polyphenols uh, the microbiome could be mediating the role of polyphenols, no? and therefore, uh, probably this whole unraveling this whole uh, uh, bioavailability question, right? Where and and uh, the papers here highlight how uh, the ellagic acid uh, in many foods uh, such as pomegranate and uh, and Indian gooseberry, etc., how our microbiome acts on it and converts it into a more available uh, form, which eventually leads to urolithin, which has uh, very interesting bioactivities such as uh, you know, mitophagy and uh, could be uh, related, uh, could, could work towards longevity and the reju rejuvenation that Ayurveda talks about. So, uh, so these are very exciting pieces that are happening. Uh, but what we have to make sure that as we apply these new tools, that we do not, these new approaches, uh, which can help us deconstruct some of these uh, formulations and generate new insights but uh, we need to make sure that we don't lose the systemic uh, systemic uh, approach or or the systemic sense of the whole thing systemic to ensure that the insights coming from pairings of botanicals right it's not just one molecule uh, that we are looking at, or even one plant extract. Why are there so many different plant extracts uh, in a formulation? So why are these pairings there? Uh, why do we use fresh ingredients in some and we use dry ingredients? The degree of oxidation, the pH, the role of pH or speciation. Why some of these require fermentation ex externally? Is it to do with the microbial transformations, the mode of delivery, the seasonal implications? There are so many perspectives that need to be brought in to get to the specificity which seems to be articulated 
articulated in the classical text and also the uh, uh, the systemic approaches from the network pharmacology uh, and the action on the multiple multiple subcellular uh, processes you know that we talk about the mitochondrial dysfunction the autophagy the membrane uh, flexibility free radical uh, generation insulin resistance inflammation epigenomics etc so i think uh, just to sum it all up la last point that we are poised today where we can truly expand our horizons by combining systemic and molecular perspectives these perspectives are complementary and when put together they can generate deeper insights which could address the complexity and the personalization which many now feel is needed to find solutions to the health challenges that are facing us yeah. so thanks and we'll be happy to uh, look forward to the discussion that follows yeah. thank you gurmeet um, amazing talk i mean it, i think it really uh, co evolved with the their food systems and uh, and everything else and it's you know thousands of years of trial and error that go into every piece of food that you put into your mouth and uh, in some sense that reveals how much we have left to discover about these uh, these systems um so we're right on time and uh, so i'd like to jump um straight into the uh, brief panel discussion so 12 to 15 minutes um and uh, the way i'm going to structure this is uh, i'm going to ask uh, each of you uh, a question in turn and uh, if there is time i'll i'll circle back and then i'll give uh, each of you a chance to say something very short as uh, advice to the students listening um, in on the call after the panel discussion um, i'm going to bring in the questions from the audience okay um so um, i'm going to go in the order of the uh, the talks themselves um so bonnie first uh, question to you um and and uh, you know i'd written this question before i heard your talk and uh, and after i heard it i really want to know <laughs> the answer how do you sustain a research program that relies uh, so uh, so deeply on on chemistry do you do you have a chemistry background yourself or or do you do you collaborate with uh, uh, with with chemists uh, of, of different types so i have very little chemistry background i was a biochemist and then i became a geneticist and I learned a lot of chemistry here. And I think, so I do have chemistry collaborators. I have a physics collaborator, chemistry collaborator, a structure collaborator, and a theory collaborator, and an engineering collaborator, right? And I think that's brain candy, right? And, and so then now the students and postdocs have all of those different backgrounds, right? Because there's more than me to advise. And so we're getting pretty good at it, at these different uh, disciplines. But, but I guess what I would say is that like my goal is to train tomorrow's scientists, not scientists that were trained like me. And so they have to be open to doing all of these different, you know, you, you wanna go after the questions, not be limited by your training. And so I will say that back to the chemistry um, part, is that these bacteria were talking with molecules, right? We knew that and we could make mutants and they didn't make molecules, but you can make mutants forever. It doesn't tell you what the molecules are, chemistry does. So the science questions initially drove us, even though we were afraid, right, to do the chemistry. And then we started to succeed and we we're like, wow, now we can ask all kinds of questions. And so then we began to incorporate structure and physics and theory, right, for sort of the same reason, but chemistry was the first. And um, it was driven by the science questions that we couldn't answer based on our own training. And so I basically kind of knocked on the doors of colleagues, Princeton's a small school. So my chemistry colleagues are just across the street, you know, so like a one minute walk away. And I kind of started knocking on the doors until, and it, these were brand new molecules. So they captivated the chemist's attention and it's been a pretty happy ride ever since. So, so can I push you on that? I mean, you, you make it sound easy, um, but you know, I also, I, I worked in this interdisciplinary interface between my training in physics and, and biology and I can, I tell you that the um, the learning curve is steep in, in both directions, right? And one of the most difficult things is to uh, sit and talk to a colleague, let's say in, in chemistry and, and uh, you know, ha have that language where, yeah. where they're able to understand what interests you. And so you know, how, how long does it take before uh, you're able to actually launch a real research collaboration? And how long oh, just discussion over coffee? Right, I agree with that. It takes real patience on both sides and it takes hanging in there. Right. And so for sure. And so, you know, now when we have lab meetings, it's up there, right. When we have lab meetings, right. You know, for the new people, and it doesn't matter whether they're an undergraduate, a new graduate student or a new postdoc, 
it's really hard for the new people because you know when the geneticists get up and talk in all their three letter words the physicists can't understand when the chemists get up and they did this on a palladium blah, 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 nobody can understand right but if we all hang in there you know and then we're and then and then we're humble and we say and you have to be willing to say i don't understand that explain that to me in simpler words you know and then we do and we're gentle to each other and we're patient with each other and then everybody comes along and i think now one thing that's really really good is that the new people are completely you know like you know like uh, they have imposter syndrome and they're insecure because you know they can see that the that the physicists can make gfp fusions and the geneticists can code <laughs> you know but i think like sitting in that room you can see those other people did it and they were like me right they had whatever the training was they were like me and if you just hang in there and if you are not so proud to say i don't understand that that helps but but you're right it was it was slow going and it didn't all happen at once right you know but then once truly and the chemistry was a start once we started to do what i would call chemical biology then we're kind of like why not physics you know why not you know we could answer these other questions why not engineering we could answer these other questions and so there there was a sort of a um we got more brave over time at the like you know we can conquer this you know if we have and then, then of course you know our collaborators have to be like that too and then and then i'll finish what i will say is that now you know because my lab kind of has a history of that students and graduate students postdocs from all different disciplines come because they can see that there's a trajectory that will give them you know there must be they don't know what they're getting into but there must be some kind of infrastructure in that lab right that ha that that allows it and so then you know it starts in the lab meetings but then it all finishes over the benches you know elbow to elbow talking over the benches drawing you know and teaching each other and um it's wonderful right it really i mean for me it i should have paid attention in organic chemistry but i didn't <laughs> and but now that i know it's because the bacteria talk like i totally think i learned it yeah I, I, I love that answer. So so humility and, and, and a kind of trust and, and the people you're training are spreading this culture. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. All over the world. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Zorana, the, the second question uh, to you. And as I mentioned, you know, the, and you uh, you also highlighted this past 10 years has been a sort of uh, uh, golden age for, for these kinds of uh, things. And, uh, you know, it's a shame Ned Seaman uh, is no longer with us, but, you know, he was really a pioneer in this area and uh, inspired many of us. Uh, to jump across these um, disciplines. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you something about the subject I'm interested in, which is uh, membranes, which, which don't feature in, 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 your, um, in, in your approach to things. So if you add membranes on top of all these very uh, cleverly functionalized uh, um, particles, will you be able to enhance the set of things that are achievable in your theory and experiments? Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question because I think what, so what you're trying to get is the, the point where we cannot achieve something that we are trying to do without the membrane. So that's the that's the point that we are trying to get to, because we are doing all these very very simple very simple systems. They are sometimes actually even too simple that they can can do something. But it turns out that, and we have some examples that if you actually put a compartment or a membrane or something, all of a sudden things actually work. But we are not putting it immediately. We are trying to get to the point where we say, okay, there is no other option for this to work unless we actually have a compartment or a membrane or something that, that, will, that will condense us or, or channel us or, or something like that. So that's the, that's the idea. So it's really all from the bottom up. So that's interesting. So you're saying that the set of challenges that you've sort of uh, explored in your current systems are not complicated enough to require um, something like this, uh, this 3D compartmentalization. So, so, so what do you think that uh, new uh, chemical challenge would be if it's not self-replication and it's not self-assembly? No, well, okay, so, I mean, okay, so the thing is, okay, so we can, we can demonstrate some things, right? But it's all in numbers, right? So the numbers that we get, so how fast things are happening, how good they are, how efficient they are, they're really like, you know, child numbers compared to what actually can be in, you can, we can see. And so I think this is the, this is really the point. It's not that, they're not uh, simple or more complex and it's just that numbers don't match. And so numbers have to come from somewhere and this is what we are trying to do. So 
even when we have a system where we can actually realize something, for example, we can we, we can make a catalyst, which actually is not not that bad if you if you if you think about it, um, because there is nothing absolutely nothing uh, well it's it's artificial in terms of it's artificial building blocks, but there is no any kind of driving. It really behaves like an enzyme, so it doesn't use energy. It's being recycled, so it sort of works. But then if you look at the numbers they just do not work you know you cannot get 10 to the 12 enhancement of anything so the numbers come from somewhere and and, and many of these elements like membranes and compartments they have to be part of that but could it come um simply from uh three billion years of optimization and you've only been doing oh, it for, for 10 years sure for sure i mean there is no doubt about there is no doubt about that i mean for sure this this uh, <laughs> this is a very important part but yeah, so there are all these elements in the equation that that contribute to the enhancement, and so what we're trying to do is 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 disentangle, and uh, and again, in, the nice thing about these uh, the, about these systems is that you can actually do kind of a, applying a kind of a, like evolutionary algorithms to try to optimize and to see how things are how things are happening, and there are so many algorithms out there now that you can you can do all kinds of things. You can try to optimize for just some types of interactions, but you can also try to optimize for shape. And such so there are really, really like lots of things that uh, that uh, that you can do, but yeah, we are doing it in in, in steps, trying to see what, uh, yeah, where, where the numbers come from. But we can only do it if we do it one at a time. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Gurmeet. I'm moving on to you. Um, so, uh, for, for first time, I, I want to ask a, a, a sort of a, a science culture question. That's a theme that's actually been running through these life science across the globe uh, talks. Um, you um, alluded to, you mentioned Ayurveda a lot, and this is a, a almost a, a sort of large monolithic uh, systematic uh, structure. Now, where does that intersect with the, the much larger body of uh, folk knowledge um, uh, in India or, or, or elsewhere? And how do you think these two different ways of approach, is it easier in some sense to bring Ayurveda uh, into uh, a fit with the uh, the kind of modern scientific techniques you mentioned, uh, or is it that uh, folk uh, uh, knowledge systems will also be amenable to that kind of approach? Well, I, uh, uh, I mean, I think Ayurveda probably is a codification of a lot of the folk uh, knowledge, right? It all started uh, in, in folk knowledge. In fact, we have a database of medicinal plants uh, and various uh, uh, used in medicine, probably the biggest such one, at least in India. Uh, and it has about 6,500 entries uh, of different species, no unique species, out of which uh, 1,200 are 12 to 1,500 are Ayurveda. There are some from Siddha, some Yunani, uh, some traditional uh, Chinese medicine, some Swarigpa, which is the Tibetan system. But nearly 3,000 of them are not in any one of these codified systems, right? Uh, they are from folk uh, knowledge, you know? so references that we got from folk knowledge. So I think there is a great value, which is even beyond, uh, which even Ayurveda has not uh, tapped into yet. And, uh, and that could be brought in. And uh, so uh, the, the modern tools, all of them have to be, I think what needs to be done is to approach these from, these, from a transdisciplinary framework with an open mind, uh, and uh, and look at the uh, the molecular understanding and couple it with the systemic uh, approaches to study these and put them together. Right? Yeah. And uh, so, so following on that, uh, if you uh, imagine that these systems are uh, actually embodied by oral traditions or you know within families and so on, and it's not really written down anywhere. Um, yeah. You know, one could imagine, and it's probably true that we're we're losing a lot of that knowledge as we speak on on a daily basis. Um, yeah. uh, in your opinion, is it likely then once you lose something like that, that uh, we'll be able to rediscover it uh, using modern methods? Or is there some sense in which the methods by which they were discovered are also lost? And so there's no way to go back and recapitulate those discoveries. I think the, the methods by which they were discovered are already lost, probably. I mean, what we have are what the equivalent of what we consider as abstracts you know, in today's papers, right? The rest of the paper is gone. So we don't have that. So uh, we are therefore 
uh, I mean, our job when we look at these is to try and deconstruct why is this formulation there, right? Uh, and how do we deconstruct? We deconstruct using these two approaches. I mean, largely the deconstruction had been so far from a simple reductionist point of view, but the last 10 years is all about uh, the systemic tools which are coming up, no? the coming together of the multi omics at low cost, the coming together of computational power, the coming together of new statistics uh, tools. No, it's not just our traditional, but the best statistics and others are coming so it's a coming together and the uh, so all of these coming together is is uh is what i think is creating uh, uh a new world it, the possibility for a new new way of exploring uh, these molecules again it's a, it's a discipline which is ripe for investigation and uh, if you're a young person this is the kind of thing that uh, i think uh, one more thing uh i mean uh, even the way we study things in clinicals no which are uh, very strict exclusion inclusion criteria to now free living studies now uh, which are becoming possible uh, is going to be game changing actually. yeah yeah thank you good so uh, actually i'm going to leave aside the uh, the question for students because there will be other opportunities to do that later because mm -hmm. um, i can see the stopwatch uh, coming down i'm going to go to the question and answer box and then come back later to to other questions if there is time um so we have a few questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read them out um, to the appropriate panelists and uh, uh, please do answer as you see fit. Now, first is a brief one uh, to Bonnie um, from uh, Michael Weiss, uh, who says, does one of the three quorum sensing molecules shown on a slide early in the presentation, in fact, contain boron? <laughs> it does indeed. <laughs> yeah. So that was a um, surprise. Right. So that molecule, which um, is made as a five carbon precursor, all back the enzyme that makes it is called Lux S. All bacteria make the same thing, and it has cis thiols. And the thing cis thiols love to make adducts with the most is boron. And so remember, these are marine bacteria. Cholera, vibrios are marine bacteria, and the ocean is loaded with boron. So the sort of instant that molecule gets made, it immediately makes this adduct with boron. And that double ringed molecule that I showed, that is the autoinducer. So we have crystals of the receptor, and we can see the boron atom in there. And it was really fun to do that. Um, maybe this is a, I don't know who this person is, but if you're a chemist, Boron has an incredible history in chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. And almost no history in biology. There's only like three molecules that are known to have boron and they all have those cis dials. And so that was a real um, surprise to us. And we actually figured it out by making the crystal and seeing the molecule in it, right? Because um, we thought, because we got the, the mass of the molecule by mass spec and you know, carbon and boron only dipped by one. And so then we had to actually see it in the crystal, right? And that's how we got it. Yep, but it does. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to read two questions together again for, for Bonnie before, uh, since they're related. One from uh, Lou Sheffer and one from Jeremy Cortez. Um, the questions are, and I think you answered this in your talk and the question may have been written before you answered it. So why do the bacteria that don't sense DPO make it? Seems like it's giving away info for free. And Jeremy asks, does DPO get metabolized or changed into any other molecule? Or is it assumed that DPO just stays in the environment without being changed? Okay, I can answer them both together. I don't know. And so the <laughs> first answer, the first, so with slightly more color than that, for the first question, we don't, I don't think the bacteria are making it and giving it away for, they're not making it because cholera is gonna be invading. I think that those microbiome bacteria, other bacteria that make DPO, presumably some or all of them use it and we just don't know what the receptor is, right? It's not VQMA, right, that, that I showed you. And so what we're trying to do is to squirt, you know, we can synthesize DPO, you know, we've got buckets of that stuff. We're just squirting them on cells and trying to do RNA-seq and see what is the Regulon that's controlled and hopefully we'll find the receptors. That's a task for us. The answer is I don't know, but I don't think they're giving it away. I think it's a signal molecule for them as well fantasy until shown differently. And then to the second question, we're trying to figure that out now. Does DPO get modified more? Does it fall back apart? It doesn't fall apart because enzymes put it together. But um, it's, it's a very stable molecule, at least under lab conditions. So we guess it hangs around, right? But um, unproven in realistic, it certainly hangs around in a test tube, you know, with a bunch of bacteria in it, unproven, you know, in an intestine or um, any real biological system like that. But that's certainly on the list of things we're trying to figure out. Thank you. Uh, next question to, uh, to Zorana. Um, Ashish uh, Bihani asks, what do you think about the role of intrinsic disorder maintained by living systems? 
in order to form complex assemblies? Would simulations based on energy minimization be able to incorporate these possibilities? Uh, so, I mean, we haven't done anything, uh, anything on that. So I think my, my answer is going to be underwhelming. Uh, I think any kind of exploration and using simulations to do this, I think it's, it's, uh, it's welcome. They can, even though um, we do a lot of approximation in simulations, they can still give us an insight on, on how to try to understand how things, how things work. So I'm sorry, Ashish, but uh, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot say more than, than that. Um, I haven't done anything. Uh, could, could I extend extend the question? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, he, he mentioned the energy minimization. So in a sense, uh, if, if you think of equilibrium uh, as having a free energy minimization principle, yeah. uh, how many of your systems are actually out of equilibrium and, and that's essential in order to make them uh, do what they're supposed to do? Yeah, so most of the the self assembly stuff is uh, is equilibrium, so it's not uh, it's not uh, out of equilibrium. For the for the replication and, and catalysis, those things definitely use up energy. So <laughs> for that one, you you need energy inputs. For cata purely catalysis that doesn't have doesn't require energy input folding. There, at least, uh, because this is very, very artificial system, because we are completely uh, manipulating which pathways are taken in the folding. This is very, very much uh, out of equilibrium. Um, so, yeah. So it's it, it really depends on what we are trying what we are trying to do. Uh, it's not always one or, or yeah. It, it's not clear which one is is best. I mean, for example, with the folding, with the in the folding case, we we do we do both because we want to understand uh, also the the the, the like the, just the equilibrium distributions and how we can manipulate that we don't get them and how we can destroy them, right? So we 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 do both, but it, it really depends on the system. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Gurmeet uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, when you think about plant-based therapeutics, don't you think that not a single molecule is responsible, but multiple active molecules are in there and responsible for their uh, action? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And that's the uh, systemic angle. Uh, and not just uh, one plant and multiple uh, molecules, but also that formulations have five plants and, and multiple molecules from all of them. So why are they all together? So we do need to uh, study them together. So the approaches of phytoprofiling and then the uh, metabolomics together, studying them together and trying to understand uh, this whole area and then the microbiome mediation in between. I think those are some of the approaches which will help. But yeah, definitely. It's at least uh, uh, the approach from Ayurveda points to multiple molecules in together and not one molecule, one benefit, right? One target. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and staying with uh, with, with Gurmeet, uh, Ashish asks. Um, says Al Biruni um, once commented on uh, Indian knowledge uh, that it is a mix of diamonds and stones. Um, so um, th th this is an, an ancient Islamic scholar, um, and uh, critical analysis is needed to sort it out. However, this analysis did not come about, and a lot of rational systems died out. How can we maintain rational schools of thought without purging? plurality of opinions yeah no, uh, I think I, uh, I think that's true of all knowledge systems that there is a lot of noise uh, and uh, I think therefore we scientists are in job to be able to uh, decipher the noise from the rest otherwise you could all have been on a whatsapp university but yeah uh, uh, I think it's a challenge and if you uh, go back to, I mean, the most knowledge systems are, have been fairly open. Maybe we've over time uh, kind of uh, uh, closed them and, 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 and gone towards maybe more faith opposed to more questioning and, and creating insights and hypotheses and moving forward with it. But I think uh, like all uh, knowledge systems, uh, a lot of the Indian knowledge systems, uh, their foundations have been very open. I mean, uh, you look at the ingredients in there and you can see from one text to the other, if you look at the chronology, more and more ingredients have come in, formulations have changed. The example that I gave you about uh, stabilization of butter oil is comes from not from the original text, which had a very different formulation, uh, but from a 15th, 16th century text, which is re very recent, you know, uh, compared to when the Ayurveda was found, uh, founded. So there have been improvements 
uh, and things have been weeded out. So it's not that it's not being done, but needs to be done way more probably. Yeah. Thank you. And there's also a question uh, about whether a reductionist approach will, will actually work. And uh, I'll just leave that in the in the chat box and maybe you can answer it just in the interest of time because I want to give uh, all three of the panelists now a chance to give uh, you know their, their, their message to students. So Bonnie first, then Zorana, then, uh, then Gurmi. Okay, so let's see, I'll say one little tidbit, which is I think sometimes um, young scientists or people thinking to go into science, they confuse challenging with I'm no good at it, right? And so, you know, you get a B on your test or your experiment doesn't work or you find the puzzles really hard, you know, and then I think that sometimes we scientists think maybe I don't have any ability here. And I would say that difficult, or challenging and lack of ability are totally different things, right? So first of all, you want it to be challenging, right? Because otherwise you don't have anything to do. And also the easy mysteries already got solved. So you want to you know, be studying the fundamental big mysteries. And so I just hope that the students who are listening, you know, don't get beaten down or drummed out of it. It's the greatest life in the world to make discoveries, you know, to be the first person to ever have a thought about something ever in history. I mean, I mean that's an amazing life. Right. And of course, it's challenging and difficult, but that's the fun of it. And so don't confuse that with maybe I'm no good at this. Thank you, um, Zorana. Yeah, so that's a, that's a beautiful message, uh, Bonnie. So what, what I will just add on that, because I, I think that uh, it's partly what uh, what uh, I was planning to say, would just add that you should always pursue to, to talk and work with people that, that you like, like that you enjoy talking to, because they don't have to be big shots and big universities. It's, it's really not about that, because the, the synergy is really, really the, the thing. And if you really like someone and enjoy talking to someone, ideas and, and things will just come out because you are in sync. And, and, that, and that's the whole point, right? So it's a, they don't have to be, I mean, just if you're just more together, then, then you are alone. And, it's important that, that you like each other and you enjoy doing that. So I will just add that to what Bonnie said. Yeah, so not to forget science is a human activity. And I think the last two yeah. years have been a, a real aberration and we're all itching to get back to uh, you know, the way we used to work. Um, sure. And uh, uh, Gurmeet, you have the final I word. Think, yeah, uh, building on, I think uh, the key is to be open you know, uh, and, and listen to uh, many different perspectives, listen to many different voices. Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, in this open openness, life is certainly about uh, you know, uh, reductionism and choices. No evolution, if you look, is all about choices. We know small differences can uh, create so much of uh, havoc. One amino acid change can create sickles and anemia yeah, from nothing. Once amino acid change created the delta variant right it was all it's it's a, it's a it's a very small change so life is about becoming specific but this reductionism this specificity happens in a network not alone right and uh, and therefore we need to understand the whole network as well the various pulls and pushes and it's all about talk and i i loved uh, i mean just building on from uh, Bonnie's talk, right, where uh, it's all about communication uh, and how molecules communicate. No, we thought we thought of food initially as fuel, right, calories, and then we thought of it as we think about it as nutrition, right, uh, micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. But today we also talk about food is information, right? It is the molecules in there are communicating with the DNA through our epigenome, right? So it is deciding, it's like the execute button on our computer and deciding which part of our DNA will execute, right? Uh, and, uh, and express. So this openness to uh, various uh, ways of thinking uh, and communicating, you know, I think those themes run uh, parallel, not just in our test tubes and, and our model systems, but in the community as well, right? I think that's Thank when you. food becomes joy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gurmit. Um, so I, I, I want to end uh, by, by thanking all the speakers. You know, you, we, you, you put these things together and you, you hope it will fly. And I think today really flew because there's a, a common theme that emerged uh, uh, between these three, uh, uh, you know, uh, talks that uh, sounded uh, very different from their titles, but uh, but really that, that chemistry team theme that holds everything together um, really uh, shone through uh, the talks today. I also want to thank uh, Janelia, Ron Vale, uh, thank Janine uh, for the opportunity to host uh, 
these uh, these talks today. And uh, I, this is such an amazing platform. The talks are recorded. Uh, people can see them all over the world, uh, either today uh, live or, or, or later. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people make use of that opportunity. Um, so um, before I uh, hand back to Janine, I just want to say that for the trainees uh, who are on the, um, uh, in the audience, um, Ulrika is going to lead uh, a session immediately after this where you'll get to meet and, uh, and chat to the panelists and she'll explain how, how that works. So thank you everybody for an amazing uh, session. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I, I just want to um, reiterate what Makun just said. I thought today's session, uh, it definitely did fly. It was really fun. It was super interesting. And um, thanks to you, Makun, and um, uh, Bonnie, Zorana, and Gramit um, for, for really, um, you know, uh, having a fantastic session. We really enjoyed it. Um, thanks to all of our audience for joining us. Um, please take a moment to complete the brief survey that is linked in the chat box. We really want to hear from you. Um, and don't forget to join our next Life Science Across the Globe event, which will be held on May 4th at the same time, 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, and you can see the title there. It's focused on microbial ecosystems hosted by EMBL.